It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Speaker, uh, people in Sault Ste. Marie and across this province are mourning the tragic, horrific loss of five people, three of them children, as a result of intimate partner violence. Tragically, gender-based violence and femicide is on the rise in our province, and it's long past time for change. A report from July of this year found that Ontario had 30 femicides in as many weeks. 30 women killed in 30 weeks. So, Speaker, my question is to the Premier. What actions will the Premier take to prevent further tragedies like we saw in Sault Ste. Marie? Reply, the Minister of Children and Community Services. Very much, uh, Speaker. Thank you very much uh, for the question, Speaker. Our thoughts go out to the victims and the loved ones and all those that were impacted by this unspeakable tragedy, Speaker. No woman should ever be subjected to violence, Mr. Speaker. And through legislation and investments, our priority will always be to provide the supports to those impacted by violence, while also ensuring that perpetrators responsible for the horrible crime of intimate partner violence are held accountable through the justice system when possible. And when it comes to violence against women and children, Mr. Speaker, we're focused on actions that deliver concrete and tangible results, and that's why we have passed laws, some of which were the first of its kind in Canada, to make it harder to victimize women. That's why we've invested significantly both in violence prevention and supports for violence. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to, when it comes to violence Bonds. against women, our government will do whatever it takes to make sure that we prevent violence in all of its forms against women. Mr. Speaker. Question. Speaker, we don't have time to waste. No. Uh, we should be doing everything we can to prevent even one more death from in intimate partner violence. Advocates have been sounding the alarm, calling for a clear and urgent strategy. Last year, we'll recall that a coroner's inquest on the murders in Renfrew gave the province 86 recommendations, 68 of those under provincial jurisdiction. But this government rejected many of those recommendations, including choosing not to declare gender-based violence an epidemic. So to the Premier, will the Premier stand with advocates and survivors and declare intimate partner violence an epidemic? Members will please take their seats. The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, every act of intimate partner violence is heinous. It has an insidious impact that tears through multiple generations of family and can hurt communities deeply. We know that when you hurt a woman, you're not just hurting her, you're hurting her, her, you're her, her children, her family and communities, and that's why we have invested significantly in community supports and organizations so that women can access them to get the support and help they need. And we'll continue to fund these organizations, like the Investing in Women's Futures program that provides wraparound supports and housing, employment, and counseling, and safety planning for vulnerable women. Uh, the Assaulted Women's Helpline, for example, Mr. Speaker, what happened in the Sioux is devastating Response. and triggering, and if you are vulnerable or experiencing violence, please call the Assaulted Women's Helpline at 1-866-863-0511. You do not need to suffer in silence. Order. Order. The final supplementary. Speaker, it might seem like a small thing to call this an epidemic, but trust me, it means everything. It means we'd give it the attention and the resources that it needs. And those groups that the minister, and I appreciate her response, but those groups, those organizations that are working on these issues in our communities are deeply underfunded deeply underfunded. And organizations, even in my own community, the South Asian Women's Centre, Abrigo Centre, if they would get the support and funding they needed to help prevent this horrifying violence from happening again, my goodness, that would mean everything. And the rates, the demand, it has skyrocketed. Under the pandemic, it's skyrocketed. It hasn't gone back down yet. And your government has not kept up. 
So back to the Premier. Will his government commit today to call this an, act, an epidemic and adequately fund survivor services? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, I thank the honourable member uh, for the question, Mr. Speaker. This is a serious issue, and a serious issue needs action and for us to all work together to make sure we prevent violence against women in all its forms across the province, in every single community, which is why the Associate Minister referenced some of the supports that have been made available. We have said from the beginning, Mr. Speaker, we're working with the federal government. We welcome the support of our municipal partners. I welcome the support of, of the opposition. Every single person has a part to play, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to eliminating violence against women in this province. That's why we have made the investments. We will not back down. We will not stop until we stop violence against women in all of its forms across the province. Mr. Speaker. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. I'll tell you, uh, Speaker, you know, those frontline organizations would be able to do a whole lot more if they didn't have to do fundraising full-time. Yeah. Anyways, my question is to the Premier. On September 25th, the Government House Leader tabled a motion to accept the report of the Integrity Commissioner into the former Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing and to approve the recommendation to reprimand that former minister. The motion is still sitting there on the order paper. So to the Premier, when will this motion be debated? To reply, the Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the uh, Leader of the Opposition will know, of course, that we had brought the motion for free unanimous consent, uh, and it, uh, it was turned down by uh, the Opposition at that, uh, at that time, and subsequent uh, conversations with members uh, on all sides. I think there has been uh, uh, some agreement that uh, uh, the former minister has accepted uh, responsibility, and that is why he has, uh, has resigned. So I have no intention of uh, moving forward uh, uh, beyond that. Thank you. A supplementary question. You, you and I know, we both know, that that unanimous consent was actually an attempt to bury the issue, bury yeah. the motion, and prevent yeah. debate. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, this government is under criminal investigation by the RCMP. The RCMP has now even appointed a special prosecutor to investigate this case, including talking to witnesses. This government muzzled by confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements. Mm -hmm. But the Premier? The Premier is just ignoring the Commissioner's recommendations to officially reprimand that minister for his well-documented misconduct. They're doing whatever it takes to avoid having this conversation in the pub public realm and in this House. So to the Premier, why has this government refused to hold the former minister accountable for his misconduct? Uh, uh, just the opposite, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the former minister uh, uh, accepted responsibility and uh, resigned uh, as a minister. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, Speaker, there have been ample opportunities for the opposition to continue debate on this, not only through the forum of, uh, of question period, but through opposition day motions uh, as well. Uh, so uh, we are, are very committed to, uh, to continuing to move forward, not in any way, shape or form uh, looking to avoid accountability, Mr. Speaker, just the opposite. That is why the Premier uh, asked me to ensure that we restore uh, uh, public trust in some of the decisions that we had made. That's why I moved to put the green belt back into uh, under the protection uh, under protection and extend uh, it uh, codify the boundaries under uh, under legislation and that is why we made some reversals on 12 official plans Mr. Speaker. So we have accepted accountability for the mistakes that we made and for those decisions that did not meet uh, the public uh, the public's faith in them. The final supplementary Speaker, the Integrity Commissioner found the former minister guilty of misconduct, not incompetence, not of being a poor delegator, but misconduct. Two serious breaches of the Members' Integrity Act in relation to a massive breach of the public's trust that is now under criminal investigation by the RCMP. But to hear the Premier or the Minister talk about it, this was just a clumsy but well-intentioned mistake. So back to the Premier. Will the Premier allow a full debate on that reprimand motion so he'll finally understand why giving his friends preferential treatment is wrong? Members, please take their seats. Government House Leader. 
in fact, uh, just the opposite, uh, Mr. Speaker. We've accepted uh, full responsibility, accepted the uh, the recommendations of, uh, of the Auditor General. That is why we moved uh, quickly to restore the lands that had been removed from the Greenbelt back into the Greenbelt. That is why we've gone further and codified uh, the boundaries of the Greenbelt uh, in, uh, in law. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, I was unhappy. The Premier was unhappy with the process that saw 12 official plans, the, some of the changes in 12 official plans. That is why I reversed those plans. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, it is about working better with our municipal uh, with our municipal partners, but it's also about ensuring that we move forward on building 1.5 million homes across the province of Ontario. I'm not going to be distracted by that uh, by that mission, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to get the job done uh, on behalf of the people of the province of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for London North Centre. Good morning, Speaker. This is my question is to the Premier. Earlier this year, Scotiabank put out a report calling for a massive expansion of non-market housing to meet the needs of low- and moderate-income families who can't afford what the private sector is willing to build. Scotiabank said the existing stock of social housing needs to be at least doubled. The NDP just released a non-market housing strategy whose goal is to do exactly that. But two days ago, the Minister of Housing said investing in non-market housing was, I quote, out of the playbook of communist Russia, end quote. Is the minister really so opposed to public investments in non-market housing that Scotiabank is too communist for him? Mr. Mr. Affairs and Housing. Actually, he wasn't listening, uh, Mr. Speaker, because what I said was the was the program Senator. that he put forward was out of the playbook of communist Russia. Now, we've gone down this road before, right? So Bob Senator. Ray did the exact same plan that the members are proposing, and that program cost us many, many billions of dollars more uh, than, they're even pro than they're promising to spend right now, Mr. Speaker. They're promising to spend, I think it's $60,000 a unit. That is what they think that they will pay to bring this type of housing on board. Right. Yet, Mr. Speaker, we are actually building social housing across the province of Ontario, working with our partners. Now, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite voted against our attempts, our successful attempts, to yeah. remove development charges from those types of homes. In York Region, that equates to removing $180,000 on average from the cost of social housing. Speaker, At the same time, throughout Toronto, for instance, I've used MZOs to build social housing, and they are opposed to that. A supplementary question. Back to the Premier. Canada's federal housing advocates, Scotiabank and the National Housing Accord, a coalition of housing stakeholders from the nonprofit and for-profit housing sectors, have all called for governments in Canada to double the existing stock of social housing, at the least. Yep. There is a broad consensus that governments need to greatly increase investments in public, nonprofit, and co-op housing. But the Minister of Housing thinks this sort of public investing in housing is communism. We hope. What hope did low- and moderate-income families have when this government is so ideologically opposed to public investment in housing? Minister of Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, I, I don't think anybody is believing the member opposite. The people of the province of Ontario know that you cannot build a home for $60,000 like the, the members opposite are, are suggesting. All right? They know that that is completely an unreasonable limit. In fact, when the Bob Ray government, government completed its proposals, they were building homes at $170,000 per unit in 1993. So the program that they put forward does not work. What are we doing? We're building affordable Order. homes across the province of Ontario. We're doing it. We're building higher and more along our transit corridors. We've removed development charges from, uh, from our social housing. We have updated the definition of affordable housing in the province of Ontario to include income and so that it could be reflected across all of the province of Ontario because we know it's unique from Toronto. It's different in the northern parts of the, pro of the province, Speaker. We've done all that. I've used MZOs to ensure that we build social housing with our partners across, uh, across uh, the, the province, Mr. Speaker. So we are getting Spons. the job done in a way that actually makes sense and delivers that type of housing for the people of the province of Ontario. Member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The next question. Member for Whitby. 
Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Ontarians need access to affordable electricity, and they never want to return to the days of out-of-control costs like they experienced under the previous Liberal government. Never again should the people of Ontario have to choose between eating and heating because of high electricity costs. People want our energy grid to be efficient, effective, clean and reliable. At the same time, Speaker, they also want to know that our government is ensuring that their energy bills remain affordable. Can the minister explain what actions our government is taking to ensure that Ontarians continue to have access to electricity that is affordable, reliable and emissions-free? And to reply, the Minister of Energy. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the member from Ontario's clean energy capital, the Durham region, for the question this morning. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Ontario's electricity grid is one of the cleanest in the entire world at over 90 percent clean. And how can we accomplish that, Mr. Speaker? Largely because of the nuclear fleet that we have in Ontario providing anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of our electricity every day in a clean, emissions-free, reliable and affordable way, Mr. Speaker. It employs 76,000 people across Canada, Mr. Speaker, almost all of them here in Ontario. And it's those same people, those skilled trades, those nuclear operators that are doing incredible work. I was with uh, my good friend, the minister from uh, Huron, Bruce, the minister of Agriculture, Agriculture a couple of weeks ago at Bruce Power, where they brought back Unit 6, one of the nuclear refurbishment projects, on time and on budget, Mr. Speaker. But, and our government is standing firmly with those skilled tradespeople in support of our energy sector, which is world class, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here, here. Supplementary question. Uh, back uh, to the Minister, Speaker. I'm so proud of our government's work in advocating for Ontario's incredible nuclear industry and its highly skilled tradespeople. The refurbishments described by the minister in his response are a massive undertaking. By completing these ahead of schedule and, yes, on budget, our government is demonstrating our commitment to building energy infrastructure projects for the future. That's why it's so disappointing to see the opposition once again saying no and once again, opposing Ontario's nuclear industry. The people of Ontario deserve far better from their elected representatives, who unfortunately are more interested speaker, in playing politics instead of finding solutions for our energy system. Order. Can the minister share his views on what the impact Question. the NDP and Liberals' opposition to our vital nuclear sector will mean to hardworking families, individuals, and a skilled workforce that relies on this source of power. Member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The Minister of Energy. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the uh, member for the supplementary. Uh, it is sad, actually, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the opposition is uh, not working with us. They're working against us, and they're saying no to clean, reliable, and affordable electricity in our province. They're saying no to new good-paying jobs across our province, Mr. Speaker. They're saying no to the economic growth that we're experiencing, largely because we have a world-class nuclear fleet, Mr. Speaker. Perhaps most disappointing, though, Mr. Speaker, is those same members from the NDP and the opposition are saying no to the skilled tradespeople, those boiler makers, those electricians, Order. those nuclear engineers that are working so hard every day, Mr. Speaker, to power our province, to ensure that we are an economic powerhouse here in Ontario, one that's created 700,000 jobs, Response. not lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs when we had an NDP Liberal coalition in this province, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario PC party and this government are going to stand up every day for those power workers across Ontario. The next question, the member for Park Hill High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Ford government recently announced its intention to seek judicial review of the Federal Impact Assessment Act in light of a recent opinion by the Supreme Court of Canada. Order. The government side will come to order. You can't interrupt the member who's got the question. 
Order. Start the clock. Member for Park Hill High Park. Speaker, this government wants to build Highway 413 and pave over Ontario Place without going through the proper process. They clearly haven't learned anything from Order. the Greenbelt scandal and continues to rush through proper evaluations and environmental assessments. Will the Attorney General stop wasting public money relitigating a Supreme Court opinion that would deliver more transparency for Ontarians? Mr. Speaker, actually, the Supreme Court confirmed that the legislation brought forward by the uh, Trudeau Liberal government was, in fact, uh, uh, beyond its jurisdiction to do so. Uh, the Attorney General, of course, is uh, using that ruling to allow us to move forward on projects like the 413, like Ontario Place. We've made no secret of the fact that we have wanted to move on important public infrastructure across the province of Ontario, and we're going to continue to do that. We've reflected, of course, on what the, the Supreme Court's uh, uh, decision, and uh, of course are encouraged by that decision. We, we have always argued that the Supreme Court, as have other provinces, that the, uh, that the uh, federal government had gone well beyond its jurisdiction. The, the Supreme Court validated that, and we are taking the next steps to ensure that we can move on with these very, very important public infrastructure programs. Uh, further evidence on this government's assault on the environment. The government has tabled four proposals to further weaken environmental oversight in the permit system for water takings, waste management, and storm water management. These changes mean the public would lose the right to participate in decisions affecting their health and safety. Worse, public oversight would be offloaded to the very same uh, private company seeking the permit. Just like the gutting of conservation authorities and the weakening of wetland protections, this government is once again enriching special interests while putting soil and water at risk. Will this government ever, ever listen to the public instead of lobbyists and show that by cancelling these proposals? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, speaker, the very premise of the question doesn't actually line up with the facts. How can the proposed regulation be secret if it's publicly available, and it has been publicly available for weeks? I, I don't know, uh, but I'm sure the member uh, would uh, suggest we, you go on the, on the listing as it's very transparent. And it's why so many Ontarians Order. can comment on these regulations right now if they want to provide their feedback. And that's the point of the system, Speaker. Uh, we consult on Ontarians with changes always. Ontario will be regulating these activities, the licenses that, uh, that we speak about. But, Speaker, this is misinformation that's being spread. All activities will be safe. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw the unparliamentary comment. Withdraw, Speaker. <laughs> All right. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Farmers, food processors, and the agri-food industry provide high-quality food products for Ontario families and for a growing export market. Measures outlined in our Grow Ontario strategy are innovative, and we are seeing positive results. Because of investments made by our government, we are witnessing an increase in more homegrown food, greater manufacturing opportunities, and improved technology for our farmers. Unfortunately, our farmers are facing additional pressures and challenges that are making it more difficult for them to deliver a food supply chain that is safe, strong, and stable. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting Ontario's agricultural industries to overcome barriers to their productivity? Thank you. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I am pleased to share with the member opposite, who's a huge champion for our agri-food industry, mm -hmm. that we are listening to stakeholders and we're listening to farmers and we're bringing forward thoughtful policies that truly are making a difference. For instance, I was so very proud to continue to support the Minister of Red Tape Reduction in his most recent piece of legislation he tabled that could translate into potential savings of $4 million for agricultural and horticultural societies societies, and we're continuing to reduce burden. But we need to be perfectly clear in this House. The biggest burden on Ontario farmers today is the carbon tax. And I think every single MPP in this House should be Order. standing up and doing
doing the right thing for Ontario farmers and saying no to the carbon tax. I am totally disgusted with the events this past week, whereby C234 has been completely gutted, especially during our harvest. I'm sure the agriculture minister, our minister I just promoted to you, the agriculture critic for ND, the NDP party. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I would love to have the member from Temiskaming and Cochrane on our, on our side, sir. Um, from the minister's response, it's clear that the carbon tax is placing a heavy burden on farmers and food producers. Ultimately, the carbon tax will negatively impact the people of Ontario. Individuals and families are already feeling the pressure of high food costs and are struggling to make ends meet. The people of Ontario are looking to our government for solutions that will reduce environmental impacts while also supporting Ontario's food processors and producers. That's why our government must act with urgency to address these serious matters. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to ensure that Ontario's agri-food sector remains stable and sustainable? Thank you. For agriculture, food, and rural affairs. Foremost, I am absolutely making clear. I am absolutely disgusted with the impact of the carbon tax that the federal government has placed on Ontario farmers. Furthermore, we need to make sure that our Liberal and our NDP MPPs understand that by supporting a carbon tax, they're supporting a tax that is going to be debilitating Shameful. when it comes to growing Ontario. But it's our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, that's listening. And because of that, we're introducing $8 million worth of programs to support the mental health of farmers in Ontario. We're introducing six, next week $16.5 million in our Ontario Agri-Food Research Initiative. We're moving forward and trying to introduce any, an incent of food and beverage manufacturers to save on energy and bring through innovations, and that program Spons? alone is a $10 million investment. Ladies and gentlemen, we also are investing $10 million in improving meat processing capacity in this province as well. We're listening. We're bringing forward programs that are going to help. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Key Wetanong. Uh, good morning, uh, Speaker. <laughs> we have lots of people in uh, Key Wetanong that are on the Alsace. To get treated, they have to travel to Thunder Bay, Sulicote, Dryden, or Kenora. They have to leave their home, Speaker. They have to leave their families. And when they, get, when they go home, it isn't because that they're getting better but it's, they go home because they have to go to their own funeral. When is this government going to ensure that there is dialysis care close to home for the people of Kiewetnu? Members will please take their seats. The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Uh, thank you for the question. Already on it. So, our government is working with Indigenous partners such as the Ministry's investment in 21 Indigenous primary health care organizations across Ontario with sites both on and off reservation and deliver a wide range of services. We've invested $10.31 million in 2021-22 from the Ministry of Health to expand culturally safe and Indigenous-led mental health and addiction services for Indigenous people living on and off reserve. In 2021, our government announced $1.5 million in annual funding to expand access to specialized mental health and addiction services in northwestern Ontario. We're getting it done. Supplementary question. Uh, speaker, uh, $1.5 million for Indigenous people in Ontario it is, Order. Is, is peanuts. But, uh, Speaker, uh, I'll say this much, Speaker, uh, the health care system does not work for Indigenous people. But, and I always also say that the system is not broken. It is working exactly the way it's designed to, which is to take away the rights of the people to the lands and the resources. It's designed to harm Indigenous people. If you say or do nothing to improve that, you are part of the problem. 
I ask, Speaker, I ask the, this government, will this government support my motion today to recognize colonialism and being indigenous as a determinant of health, yes or no? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I appreciate the, the member opposite's uh, question. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of work that is being done uh, across the province of Ontario uh, uh, with partners in Indigenous communities, uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, in Northern Ontario and across, really across the province, uh, uh, Speaker. But I can confirm for the member uh, that we will not be supporting this motion today. We will continue to double down on our efforts to improve health care for all Ontarians, including uh, Indigenous partners. Uh, as well, Mr. Speaker, we are continuing our, our uh, efforts with the federal government uh, also to address some of the very important issues that, uh, that we're seeing uh, on reserves, and we will continue that work. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Mr. Speaker, for the Premier, just two months after the release of the Auditor General and the Integrity Commissioner's damning Greenbelt reports, the government is acting like all is forgiven. Well, the people of Ontario don't see it that way, and neither does the RCMP. Our province was taken on a wild roller coaster wild while, a, right, while a handful of developers hit an $8.3 billion jackpot. Mr. Speaker, this isn't a casino in Las Vegas. This is the people's house. And as the government members are learning, the number one rule in gambling is that the House always wins. Between the Greenbelt debacle, the RCMP criminal investigation, the appointment of a special prosecutor, the urban boundary flip-flop, and three ministers resigning, I've never seen a government try so hard to make their losses look like wins. With so much money and time wasted, so much to undo and cover up, Order. why should the people of Ontario believe this government can fix health care, housing, and affordability? Question. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Again, Speaker, a, an odd question coming from a member who was running for the leadership of the Liberal Party but dropped out of the race so that he could support a candidate who is raising principally all of her money from developers, the same people that he's just criticizing, Mr. Speaker. The same, the same candidate who is the only candidate that actually wants to still build on the Greenbelt, Mr. Speaker. So it is a very odd question coming from that particular gentleman. He had other people that he could have supported in a Liberal leadership, but he chose to support the one Order. person that is doing everything that he is critical of right here in the House, Mr. Speaker. Pot calling the kettle black. Boy, I get it is over there. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, when all the member across as Bonnie Crombie lines, that's how you know he's actually got nothing. <laughs> the people of Ontario have a government that is more interested in distracting and dividing than actually righting any of its wrongs. My constituents in Don Valley East know they aren't getting the full story on the destruction of the Science Centre. Where is that business case the Minister of Infrastructure promised us? Amidst the Greenbelt scandal, the urban boundary flip-flop, it's clear this government is using wedge politics to distract from the RCMP criminal investigation to divide and misdirect us. Speaking of misdirection, yesterday the government tried to put forward a motion begging the federal government to help them clean up their own affordability mess. The Premier could focus on things like rent control, the Ontario Child Tax Benefit, or boosting social assistance instead. Mr. Speaker, when will the Premier tell his government to start doing and stop distracting? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I always look forward to an opportunity to speak about how we're actually saving the Science Centre. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Science Centre, the Science Centre, although safe facility and continues to operate, is an old facility, and what we're trying to achieve here is build a new facility with more exhibition space that will be around for young people and Ontarians for the next 50 years, and we're very pleased that we're bringing the Science Centre to Ontario Place, bringing the Science Centre, keeping it alive, as well as bringing Ontario Place alive as well. Thank you. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Oh, great, Minister. All Ontarians deserve to feel safe in their communities. 
That's why it's concerning to hear from individuals and families in my riding that they're worried about reports of increasing crime and violence throughout Ontario. The public safety of all Ontarians must be our government's highest priority. The people in my community and all Ontarians are counting on our government for support and solutions. While there has been progress in taking down gangs and cracking down on firearms, our government must do more to prevent and reduce criminal activity. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain what actions our government is taking to increase safety in communities across Ontario? Oh, good question. To reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from my colleague. And she's right. Public safety matters to everyone in Ontario, and our government takes it very seriously. We're taking action, Mr. Speaker, to protect the people of Ontario, and that's why the government created the Gun, Gangs and Violent Reduction Strategy. We're reducing illegal gun and gang violence by providing the resources to local police, prosecutors and community partners across the province. And I'm really proud of this. The strategy funds several initiatives that deliver strong enforcement and prosecution, proactive gang disruption, and tailored youth and adult violent violence prevention. Mr. Speaker, the amount that we have supported in this fund, together with our federal partners, is over $256 million. And most importantly, Mr. Speaker, we are a government that has the backs of everyone that keeps Ontario safe. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The Solicitor General's response will be appreciated by the many constituents who have contacted me with their concerns. It's reassuring that initiatives through the Guns, Gangs and Violence Reduction Strategy are providing communities with the resources they need. Since 2018, under the leadership of our Premier, our government has made it clear that gun and gang violence will not be allowed to thrive in Ontario. Our province continues to see positive results from investments made by our government that support our frontline police and the justice sector. However, we must continue to provide more resources that will help dismantle criminal activity. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain how our government is supporting our frontline police officers in responding to and preventing crime and violence in Ontario? Good question. Once again, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question, and the member is correct. Public safety matters, and that's exactly why last month our government announced an investment of more than $2.8 million in new equipment and technology to help police services across the province better protect communities against gun and gang violence. And I'm talking, Mr. Speaker, about the closed-circuit television, more commonly known as CCTV. The funding is being delivered through a special CCTV grant program that is part of our Ontario's gun, gang and violence reduction strategy. And we know that 24-hour monitoring, that 24-hour monitoring by so many police services across our province are allowing them to keep our community safe. In the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, we have a right to live safely in our own homes and communities. And that's why our government will always have the backs of everyone that keeps Ontario safe. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. A uh, question is to the Premier. Speaker, from the Greenbelt grab to MZOs to private evangelical colleges, this government has shown that if you're a friend of the Premier, you will get their special attention. A phone transcript has revealed that the previous Minister of Colleges and Universities, who is the current uh, Chief Government Whip, had assured the Premier's friend Charles McVitie that McVitie's private evangelical college would get university status. Regardless regardless of the independent application review process. At the same time, that minister was telling this House that they, quote, don't meddle with procedural fairness and that there was, quote, no way to stand in the way of an independent process. Speaker, did the Premier know what his minister was promising to Charles McVitie? 
Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let, let's look at the timeline of events here. Speaker, the former minister received PCAB's recommendation and accepted the recommendations years ago. Then the Court of Appeal dismissed Canada Christian College's appeal, and the ministry is uh, accepting the court's decision and uh, thanks the courts for their work on this matter. But, Speaker, maybe instead we should focus, uh, the opposition should focus their time on matters that courts have already ruled on. They focus on, you know, what are we doing now? We, every year, this ministry spends millions of dollars on research to support the latest, latest medical advancements, EV and other critical fields. Our government is getting shovels in the ground to build housing, Order. highways, new student housing opportunities across this province. But again, the opposition says no to every single initiative. As Minister of Colleges and Universities, I'm ensuring that our government is getting it Response. done through investing in health Order. human resources to ensure that we have more doctors, more nurses, and a new medical school in this province. A supplementary question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you so much, Speaker. When asked about the approval process for Charles McVitie's private college in 2020, the former Minister of Colleges and Universities stood in this House, and I read from Hansard. There is no process that exists that is more fair and accountable than the process we are following, and that there was no ministerial involvement whatsoever. Now we learn, on the phone, he was actually attempting to rig the process, giving advice on submissions and promising McVitie that he would get them where they needed to go, even if the independent board did not approve the requests. Once again, it's only after this government has been caught that they will reverse course. Question to the Premier, yes or no, when has this government been entirely pro truthful about this process? I'm going to caution the member on the use of her language. Minister of Colleges and Universities can respond. I think I've been extremely clear. The former minister received PCAB's recommendations and accepted, accepted those recommendations years ago. The Court of Appeal then dismissed Canada Christian College's appeal. We're moving forward. This, what this ministry is doing is looking at making investments and ensuring that we have more nurses across this province. We've increased the number of medical seats. We have a new medical school being built in Brampton as well as Scarborough, the first medical schools that we've seen in the GTA in over 100 years. This is the focus of what this ministry is doing, ensuring that we have trained professionals in all fields across this province. The member for Don Valley North. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Speaker, the issue of cars being stolen in the GTA has worsened. CBC has cited an increase of 48.3% year over year in Ontario alone. This also happened to my close personal friends, Alan, Neil, Alex, etc. The same article also stated that 80% of the stolen vehicles are leaving the country, and much of the profits are used by organized crime rings to fund illegal activities like drug and gun trafficking. Speaker, I have heard the growth growing safety concern from the constituents in my riding of Don Valley North, as some of these crimes have escalated into more violent robberies and even broke into houses to obtain car keys. Question. Speaker, my question is, what is this government doing to ensure Ontarians feel safe again? Thank you. To reply, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to acknowledge the question from my friend opposite. Our government finds it unacceptable that every 40 minutes, somewhere in Ontario, a car is stolen. And that's why we've made a record investment of over $51 million to provide the technology and grants for the municipal services and the OPP to combat this. Mr. Speaker, just last two weeks ago, the Attorney General and I were in Bromont, Quebec for the federal, provincial and territorial meet meeting. And I've asked my federal colleagues, step it up at the border, step it up at the Port of Montreal. It's completely unacceptable that our cars are going out through the Port of Montreal. And I want to acknowledge the announcement made yesterday by Toronto Police Service with the record bust. Over a thousand cars were identified and recovered. 
Well, thank you to Chief Demke, and thank Fine. you to everyone at Toronto Police Service that is working to keep our community safe. Yes. 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 Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for his response. Speaker, many, con many constituents have raised the question to me on how so many of these stolen vehicles are end up in Africa and the Middle East, as this has apparently become very lucrative to criminals. Speaker, Canada needs updated federal vehicle theft prevention regulations, as well as strong enforcement at our borders. Speaker, my follow-up question to the Solicitor General is, how can the multi-level gov government coordinate with each other to resolve this public safety issue? Thank you. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. An example of this is how we work together with all, and thanks to Premier Ford's coalescing all the premiers and territorial leaders in such a short time to write to the federal government and to urge them to enact meaningful bail reform. And C-48 is now in the Senate, and it's as a result of the leadership of this Premier. It's important to know, Mr. Speaker, that we want to keep these violent and repeat offenders off our streets, and that's exactly what we're going to do. And in the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, our government cares deeply about our public safety. We will do everything we can to keep Ontario safe. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brantford Branch. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. Ontario's housing crisis is having a profound impact on people all across our province. Parents are worried that their children may never be able to afford to live near them. Young families are struggling to save enough for a down payment. Seniors on fixed incomes worry about being displaced. Speaker, everyone in Ontario deserves to have a place to live that fits their needs and their budget. Individuals and families are looking for real solutions in finding affordable housing, and they need answers now. That is why our government must continue to focus on addressing the housing crisis. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain what actions our government is taking to increase the supply of housing across the province of Ontario? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, uh, and thank you to the member from Brantford Brant. Um, I know he has children that live in this province that want to stay in this province, and we cannot let the dream of home ownership be extinguished. So, Speaker, our plan is working. 11 per cent of our 1.5 million uh, home target has already been achieved. 165,000 homes, up, I might add, 20,000 per year than what the previous government achieved. Speaker, our plan is working. 14,000 14, new rental starts year over year, up an impressive 43.5 per cent over last year. Speaker, our plan is working, but we know that much more needs to be done. For example, Speaker, working with the Minister of Infrastructure, we're looking at surplus government lands that we can build affordable and attainable homes Response. for all our people, seniors, students, newcomers, and yes, like first-time home buyers, Speaker, we will not let the dream of home ownership be extinguished. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It is so positive to hear about the steps our government is taking to increase housing supply that will ensure better affordabilities for buyers and renters. Our government was elected with a mandate to change lives by making housing affordable once again. People who work hard and save diligently deserve to know that they won't find themselves forever shut out from owning a home. For those who rent, they deserve security, not the fear of rising rents. And that is why our government must implement a clear plan to bring about positive results. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain what actions our government is taking to open opportunities for Ontarians to find homes that fit their needs and their budgets? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you to the member from Brantford Brant. Um, we have a mission, Speaker, and that's to get keys in the people's hands who need housing, whether it's housing stability or the dream of home ownership. Well, that is why we're cutting red tape, Speaker. The minister below here is uh, right on track with his bills. We're reducing costs 
we are expanding the opportunity, whether it's laneway suites, whether it's duplexes, whether it's modular housing. We also know, Speaker, that government cannot solve this crisis on its own. That is why we are convening a comprehensive housing summit in late November, a call to action by all stakeholders, Speaker. Bold, innovative, and deliverable results will be achieved. We're looking at all partners, whether municipal, not-for-profit, modular home builders, community home builders, and yes, the private sector, Speaker, because we believe the private sector is a key component to getting these houses built Response. in the next 10 years. Speaker, we have a bias for action. We have a sense of urgency, and under this Premier and this government, we will not, will not let the dream of home ownership be extinguished. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In my community, in Niagara Lake, people are facing challenges accessing frontline health care services. More than one in every three residents, many of whom are seniors, don't have a family doctor. Shame. Getting a nurse practitioner back in the town would help fill this gap in services. The town has reached out to the Minister of Health, who confirmed they would be getting a nurse practitioner services they need. But the town hasn't heard back in a year. Speaker, why is the government refusing to help the Lord Mayor, the Town Council, and the people of Niagara Lake get the health care they need and deserve? Thank you. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Well, I'm not sure where the member opposite has been when we announced a $30 million expansion to primary care in the province of Ontario, and we are assessing those interests right now. I believe the member opposite and his NDP party voted against that wow. investment. Yeah. $30 million, yeah, an great. increase in yeah, primary great. care, multidisciplinary approach. One that I may add, Speaker, is the first time that we have had an expansion in the primary care multidisciplinary area since we formed these, uh, these projects at the beginning. We absolutely understand that we need to expand. But that is why we are doing so much, whether it is working with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario and directing them to review, expedite, and ultimately license internationally educated physicians who are waiting Response. to practice in the province of Ontario. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Minister, you made a promise to the Lord Mayor and the Council. Please deliver on that promise. Please, yeah. Niagara and Lake isn't the only community suffering due to this government's mishandling of health care. In Fort Erie, residents are dealing with a reduction in the hours of the Douglas Memorial Urgent Care. Residents who show up late at night in need of help are being turned away. We know that this government's actions, like Bill 124 and underfunding hospitals by billions, have worsened the staffing crisis in our hospitals. Speaker. When is this government going to address the staffing crisis, stop fighting nurses in court, and ensure Fort Erie gets back 24-7 urgent care services today? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Where was the member when we were announcing and at the groundbreaking for the Niagara South Hospital? Oh, that's right. He was actually there. So you understand that we are making investments in Niagara Region with the new hospital, with expanded primary care cl clinics that are going to make a real difference in his community and communities across Ontario. We will continue to make these investments whether or not the member opposite and the NDP vote against them. But I must say, when we make investments and expansions in residency positions, the NDP vote against it. When we make investments in primary care expansion, $30 million, they vote against it. When we make investments in over 50 capital builds, whether they are new builds like the Niagara South Hospital or expansions and renovations, the NDP vote against it. We'll get the job done. Response. The NDP can continue to oppose all of these health care investments. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, it's time for a real question. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I had the honour of representing our great Minister of Long-Term Care at the grand opening of the West Perth Village, an upgraded long-term care home. 
of 128 new beds in my riding of Perth, Wellington. It was a great day, Speaker, sure and I want to give a shout out to the West Perth community and all the volunteers that came together to make this project, project a reality. The board began this project many, many years ago. It's unfortunate under the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, there was no movement, none, Speaker, on getting this 128 beds built. Speaker, can the Minister of Long-Term Care please inform this House on what our government is doing to get long-term care homes built across my riding of Perth, Wellington and Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, what a question from the member from Perth, Wellington this morning, and he brings up some important facts, doesn't he? It's under the leadership of this Premier that this government, in five years, has 18,000 homes built for shovels in the ground today. Now, let's not get lost in the numbers. We need to build more, and we know that. Now, the member mentions West Perth, which is fantastic, but that's not the only beds that have been announced since uh, this uh, government came to power. Let's talk about Ritz Lutheran Villa, 128 redeveloped beds, uh, Nallcrest Lodge, three new spaces, uh, Saugeen Valley Nursing Home, 87 redeveloped uh, spaces, Strathcoma Long-Term Care, nine new spaces. Speaker, and we're going to keep going because it's not just about capacity, it's about health human resources, investing nearly $5 billion to have the best quality of care and focusing on outcomes as well. I want to thank Response. the member from Perth Wellington for a fantastic question this morning. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And the Speaker, uh, the Minister of Long-Term Care, will be great to know. I got another great question for him. Wow. I'm glad our government is taking immediate action to support our seniors and the ones who literally built our great province. Speaker, the Minister alluded to some of the other great projects in my riding. I'm pleased to say, under this Premier and this Minister of Long-Term Care. We are going to build, and in the process of building, 943 new long-term care beds in my riding alone, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, as we know, under the previous Liberal government, they built 611 beds in the entire province, Speaker. As many people in this place will know, interest rates are higher, there's co rising costs to construction, but that's not stopping us, Speaker. We're going to continue to get long-term care beds built across Ontario. Can the minister please share with this House what our government is doing to continue to support our long-term care sector to get it done? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Long-Term Care. You know, that member's not only tall, he's hardworking, and it really shows this morning, Speaker. You know what this last Minister of Long-Term Care did, recognizing that construction was challenged with increased costs and supply chain challenges? He introduced the construction funding subsidy, which led to the building of over 11,000 spaces for our wonderful seniors in the province of Ontario. I want to thank the Minister for that work. But that's not all he did. He introduced something called the Local Priorities Fund which actually targets the outcomes within our health care system. That includes, of course, long-term care homes. You know what this member got in his writing? Let's talk about it there, Speaker. $8,700 to Spruce Lodge for the purchase of diagnostic equipment, $52,000 to Kingsway Lodge for the purchase of specialized bariatric equipment, as well as better outcomes for the dementia seniors that live there, uh, $19,000 to Kingsway Lodge for the purchase of diagnostic equipment, and the list goes on, Speaker, because why? If we can keep our seniors out of the hospitals for minor ailments, fractures, that's a better outcome for the hardworking people of this province. Speaker, let's say it again. Seniors in this country, they took care of us. That member and this government is taking care of them. That's right. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. 212 days ago, my private member's bill, Bill 74, Missing Persons Amendment Act 2023, was ordered to the Standing Committee on Justice Policy. That was seven months ago. Since then, there have been numerous vulnerable missing persons reported across Ontario. Some have died. Some have been found and reunited with their loved ones. Others have yet to come home. These cases have shaken neighbourhoods, and the search continues to this day. 
Bill 74 is a solution that, since read into this legislature on March 6, has come up time and time again as a viable option and resources for our communities. It addresses the safety and well-being of lost, vulnerable persons. So I ask the Premier, when will you join the over 100,000 Ontarians who have signed petitions and bring 74 to committee and pass this important legislation? To reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, everyone has a right to live safely in their own homes and communities. And, Mr. Speaker, I want to give a shout out today because it's important to thank the 911 call operators, the telecommunicators that keep Ontario safe each and every day. Just this past Saturday night, I toured late in the evening the Comm Centre in Peel. But, Mr. Speaker, whether you are a senior, whether you are a person with an exceptionality, whether you are a young person, everyone has an equal right to be safe in our province. We take our public safety concerns extremely seriously, and I want to reassure everyone in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, we will always have the backs of everyone that keeps this province safe. The supplementary question. Back to the Premier. The weather is changing in Ontario. Winter is around the corner. Soon we will have snow and cold temperatures to compete with. Water will be more dangerous. Sunset earlier in the day, of which will make finding a missing person even more challenging. Our most vulnerable will be left to brave these elements, and so will those looking for them. Bill 74 fills a gap and adds another tool to the toolbox during the most critical time when a loved one goes missing, the time when they may still be close to home, confused, scared, and trying to find a familiar face, a time when neighbours can help search, increase their awareness, and check their familiar areas like their backyards, the bus routes, and the parks. So I ask again for all Ontarians, including our most vulnerable populations, when are you going to pass Bill 74 and support for the expanded alert for vulnerable missing people? Solicitor General. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, everyone in our province has a right to live safely. But what we're doing, what we're doing, and I want to tell the member opposite, is we're putting more boots on the ground. We're making an investment at the Ontario Police College so that we can have more people to keep our community safe. Whether, whether you are a senior, whether you are a young Order. person, whether you are a person with exceptionalities, everyone has a right to be safe in our province. And that's why our government has made unprecedented investments to put more boots on the ground, to keep our communities safe, to fight auto theft, to keep the violent and repeat offenders off our streets. Mr. Speaker, to this government, our public safety matters. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. Order. Order.